okay? So we'll go back to another video. Here's a little expression that I guess it's a little more tame than, you know, some of my um, videos in the past, but we're going to do something a little bit just simple and simplify this following expression. Uh, so we have the natural log of cosine of x minus i times y divided by cosine of x plus i times y. So we're dealing with this in terms of complex numbers. And of course, with natural logs numbers, so I think it's pretty obvious to see that there's going to be some properties we will be using for that. But not only that, we also have trigonometric functions of cosine and, um, well, and also its input with both the sum and differences. So pretty much you can expect that we'll be using a bunch of those trig identities to help simplify things to the, you know, the furthest we can possible. Uh, as, um, since this is just a simple algebraic expression just to, um, simplify as further as we can, there's really not that much that really needs to be go over as with those simple properties I just mentioned. So with that, let's actually just jump right in. So as we see, we have a division of the input. So we can see that we can actually write this in terms of the difference of natural logs and that, that we can write this as natural log of cosine of x subtract i times y, then subtract ln of the same input, but except it's just the sum. So x plus i times y. What we can do here is because we have these differences and sums of the inputs, so we're gonna actually gonna use these following properties. So using that, we'll be having that the difference over here is written as follows. So we would have cosine of x multiplied by cosine of i times y, then add this with sine of x uh, multiplied by sine of i times y. And let me actually go into the next line. So this is actually the same um, properties over here, just like this, except that this is actually going to be a subtraction. So cosine of x, then cosine of i times y, then subtract sine of x, then times sine of i times y. How can we go further into simplifying this. Here's a little property we'll be using, especially that now that we have an input of, you know, of an imaginary unit. So we, here's, here's, the, um, here's the property we'll be using. So I'll write this in a different color. So here's, some, so here's what we'll be using. There's actually gonna be um, two properties we'll be using. So the first one is that um, the cosine of some input i times x, x variable, specifically i is an imaginary unit, um, that identity is going to actually going to be the hyperbolic cosine of some input x. And then another one we'll be using is that sine of i times x is going to equal, um, actually, I guess it's worth noting that first specifically, I know I went a little ahead of myself, that um, the hyperbolic sine of h, um, its identity can be written as negative i times um, sine of i times x, as we see that there's a sine of i times an input y, so we want to solve this on its own and then afterwards. So hence, we have this um, new rewritten expression that the new identity for sine of i times x on its own is going to equal positive i times hyperbolic sine of um, x. And so from here, now we can actually make these little substitutions. So let's actually um, perform that. So now everything here, so let's see, I'm gonna put this as equals. So now the natural log of, um, so this will still be cosine of x. Now replace the cosine i to y with the um, identity for the hyperbolic sine of x. Okay, and then now we just add this with i times um, sine of x and then multiply by sine or the, multiply by the hyperbolic sine of y using this identity over here that we just, um, you know, use. Okay, and now next is um, going down to the next line, subtract, um, just to perform the same thing over here. So this is gonna be cosine of x. And then, um, so same, same, same input over here, just replace this, it's gonna be a subtraction. So hyperbolic cosine of x, then subtract i times sine of x multiplied by hyperbolic sine of y. And now we can actually just go a little backwards and put this as a single natural log um, argument. So now this, of course, will come down to the natural log of, so this will be the numerator and then this will be under the denominator. So cosine of x times hyperbolic cosine of x, or um, rather specifically, this is supposed to be y. Uh, my apologies for the mistake. Yeah, same thing, same thing over here as well. So this is gonna be a y and then that's gonna be a y and then over here will be a y. And now add this with, so I'm just putting this back in, sine of x and then hyperbolic sine of y. All this being divided by this input over here. So cosine of x, then hyperbolic cosine of y, subtract i times sine of x, then multiply by hyperbolic sine of 
why. Now you might be thinking, what's next from here? <laughs> what else can we do? Is this another trick identity we can do? Not at that stage just yet. However, we're gonna do something a little bit of a clever trick in order to make um, you know the future steps a little bit easier. So next thing I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to divide cosine of x times hyperbola cosine of y to both the numerator and denominator. And so what that means from here, from these inputs would now become one. This will be the natural log of one plus, okay? And then if I were to divide this um, by the same cosine x divided by hyperbola cosine of y, that actually yields out to be a tangent identity. So this will be i times tangent of x times hyperbolic tangent of y all this being divided by so it's the same thing so instead this is going to be a minus so i times tangent x and then times hyperbolic tangent of y now there's actually some things we can actually do so we can convert this back into so this is still under um it's still a complex number so what we can do is we can actually write these both the numerator and denominator inputs in a form of you know using the polar coordinate so i guess we, sh we should do a little bit of you know let's uh, recall some things so for some complex number z um, z is equal x times uh, x plus i times y uh, the polar form can be written as r times e to the power i times data data is some arguments for you know z is um i'll just i know i already said that again but let me write that down then we know that the radius aka that's the modulus the distance from the origin to whatever your complex point of the complex plane is located at is going to equal r times the square root of your both your inputs the real part and the imaginary part x plus y square and then theta is going to equal, so originally we have tangent theta is equal to y over x, just take the inverse of um, both sides, and so, so we have that theta is equal to inverse tangent of uh, y divided by x. And so with these you know, formulas, this is actually going to become a little bit easier to make things a little bit simpler. So let's actually put all the pieces back together. So the equals is denoting this next line over here. So we have the natural log of um so now this is going to be and of course taking one step further ahead we're going to actually you know go in reverse another time and put this back as a difference of natural logs so we so we convert all both the numerators and denominate the numerator and the denominator using these you know formulas of a you know polar form representation of a complex number so here's what we're going to have so first we're going to have the square root so this is actually dealing with the numerator first this will be one plus tangent square of x multiplied by the hyperbolic tangent square of y that's our that's our you know our modulus the radius then multiply by e to the power i then multiply with substitute your data so this will be uh tangent or inverse tangent of um so this our y in this situation the imaginary part is going to be the um sine of or wrong one um it's going to be tangent of x and then hyperbolic tangent y all this divided by x which is one so um this is just looking at the, the imaginary part so tangent x and then hyperbolic tangent of y okay so that's our first then let's do another subtraction and technically it's also the same thing because um if you think of this in terms of like the conjugate so they share both of the, the properties is that um with the conjugates it's that they actually share the same distance so this is actually going to be the same radius so our input is one plus tangent square x then times hyperbolic tangent square of y and this time it's going to be i to the power negative i since this is a negative tangent x tangent um or hyperbolic tangent of y and you know our tangents are actually it's an odd function so we can factor out that negative so this is where we get the negative i and then inverse tangent of negative um or inverse tangent of tangent x and then hyperbolic tangent of y we can actually apply um more with the natural law property since everything in here is an input of you know with multiplication so with that we, we can write this in terms of a you know sum so um, interestingly, so let me actually first write this out and then I'll discuss things a little further. So what we did here is that because as mentioned that the inputs under multiplication, so we can write this as a sum of natural logs. So hence that's why I separate this out as natural log of, you know, the radius, then add this with the ln of e, so that'll cancel each other out and so all you're left with is just the exponent. Same thing can be applied over here. You'll notice that we actually have some terms that cancel each other out, specifically both the natural logs of the radius and its conjugate. So this and this is out of the question. And so all we're left with with these two inputs. So add these two together, so you get double so actually the answer is that or rather it's finally reduced to at its fullest that this expression is reduced or simplified to two times i times uh, inverse tangent of tangent x and then times 
hyperbolic tangent of y. And so just like that, we are actually done. As uh, simple as it gets, uh, you just let me, you let me know if there's actually you can, if it's possible to simplify this um, expression even further. I highly doubt it, but you know, give yourself a challenge, so why not? So yeah, that's uh, pretty cool if you ask me.